I'm hoping the Big Ten has to modify their system for us. <laughs> it's probably like getting great 10 sandpaper rubbed on your face every day. I mean, we say it all the time, whether, you know, there's two types of turds, you're a sinker or you're a floater, but you're still a turd, right? I mean, um, we're, we're, we are about players and players playing the plays and not necessarily the plays. Welcome to the Varsity Club Podcast. My name is Derek Peterson. Joining me this week, I have Hale Varsity's managing editor, friend of the pod, excellent word writer, appreciator of any and all things retro starter windbreakers and Billy Napier's biggest hater, Brandon Vogel. Brandon, welcome back. How are you? Doing well. Um, I think most of that was accurate. I guess we'll get into maybe what wasn't accurate as we as we as we work through things here. So it's one of those two truths and a lie situations, is what you're saying. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. Um, real quick, some housekeeping points. Subscribe to Hill Varsity. You get the magazine, you get premium online coverage, and you get annual tie rankings. Uh, from the good man himself, Brandon. Go to hailvarsity.com backslash subscribe. Also, Brandon has an own, his own podcast, so subscribe to that if you don't already. It's the I-80 Preview Podcast. So as I'm sure you can guess, this week it's a Minnesota preview. Lots of good stuff. I was listening to it before getting on this podcast with Brandon. We're recording on a Thursday. Um, while you're in there using whatever podcast listening app you prefer, check out the full catalog of podcast offerings. This show is a proud part of the Herd App Media Network. On the Hill Varsity side, you can get the Straight Up Breakdown podcast, which I was actually on this week. So go listen to your boy with Greg Smith, the Mind Your Own podcast with Aaron Sorensen and Sasha Durkin, and then the Nebraska Preps postgame show with Jacob Padilla and Damon Benning. Last thing, shouts to Cam for producing this episode every week. Brandon, Luke Fickle has the Cincinnati Bearcats at 5-0. and Cincinnati, 5-0, and ranked number three in the country. It's the highest the Bearcats have been in the AP poll and program history, and they're looking like a good bet to make the college football playoff if they keep winning. They'd be the first team from a non-Power 5 conference to do so if that happens. There are some, you know, like there's a there's a bad part of it. It took one of the most chaotic weekends in, in, inside the top 25 in, in recent memory for them to get up there, and it took them having Notre Dame and Indiana on the schedule to give them that oomph that they need to get up to number three. The Notre Dame game was scheduled in 2019, so not too far in advance. The Indiana game was scheduled in 2014. Uh, basically, everything is broken right for Cincinnati. Indiana's coming off a big year, so it still has that kind of name recognition, um, but it's not a great team this season. And then Notre Dame is is perennially pumped up in the preseason and they're pretty seems to be pretty overrated um this year the good part though is that this is a really good cincinnati football team with a good quarterback and an elite defense um and for them to be at three right now with alabama having that loss to Ole miss it kind of seems like assuming they keep winning they'd be in that two three matchup in the playoffs instead of the one four matchup which means you know, assuming things hold, which isn't a safe assumption, given what happened last weekend, um, they might avoid Georgia in a semifinal. So like, you know, win-win situation for Cincinnati. Luke Fickle is the hottest name on the coaching market. The USC job is open. LSU is probably coming open. There will probably be several others that pop open later in the year. If James Franklin gets the USC gig, then Penn State will be open. Um, But if Cincinnati makes the playoffs and either wins a semifinal game or they keep it competitive, would they become a team that is suddenly in the conversation moving forward as long as they're unbeaten? Because like it, it, if, they, if you get into it, it seems like there, you know, there is a barrier right now for a G5 team to get into it. But if that barrier is broken and the team that gets into it doesn't get smashed, they don't get blown out. It's not like 59 to seven. And it looks like they don't have a chance. Presumably that opens the door for more G5 teams if they have a, a good enough season. Um, my question for you, would the situation he's in right now be better for him than going to a different place with more pressure and expectations? So like Cincinnati would presumably pay him a raise to keep him if he makes a college football playoff. And you're kind of in the same boat that like Mark Stoops is at Kentucky So like, do you want to be the head coach at LSU where an 11 and one season is the expectation? Or do you want to be the head coach at Kentucky where a couple of 11 and one seasons gets you a statue? And then there's this added element. I was reading a a story from CBS Sports, Dennis Dodd this morning. Luke Fickle said, I didn't enjoy the experience I had being a head coach. And he was talking about his time at Ohio State when he took over for Jim Trestle. 
So my question, Brandon, after all of that talking, I'm sorry, should Luke Fickle leave this situation for a different job? Probably not. I, and I, and I went back and forth on this. And so the other piece of this for me is, you know, Cincinnati uh, is <clears throat> headed to the big 12. So like, there's, there's part of me that thinks, okay, if you want to make that transition, it can be tough. We saw this with, with Nebraska. Um, we've seen it with a couple of other teams that things can just jumping over there is, is obviously a benefit for the school. That's why they're doing it, but it can be tough in terms of a coaching regime, but you look at that reconfigured big 12 and think, Cincinnati at the current level that they're at under Fickle is maybe, I mean, what, the third or fourth best team in that, in that conference. Like if they've got it rolling at that point um, and you can kind of lock down Ohio, I mean, that, that conference is going to be entirely reshaped and it's going to be a national conference, which, which brings its own problems. So with that being the factor, and I mean, Luke Fickle has spent basically his entire career in the state of Ohio. He, he played at Ohio State. He got the interim job. He, he went to Cincinnati. And if Ohio State were ever to open back up, then he's still doing what he's doing now. He's probably a candidate for that job, um, which would be strange because of how the interim year went. And it's interesting for me to hear you say that you, you'd read some comments about how he didn't like that part of it. You know, that was an impossible situation for anyone. And he probably did about as well as he could, given everything that was going on in Columbus at the moment. So I kind of look at it like Cincinnati's getting bumped up. Like it's getting, you know, there. Why not just stay where you're at and keep running the system that you know? Like it won't be that big of a systematic change, which was kind of my first gut reaction. Um, and when you look around the conference, like it's better to be a top three school in your particular conference than, well, this is true most of the time, than it is to be at one of, say, the top three jobs in the country, because then you get all the extra stuff with it. You have no margin for error. So if I were Luke Fickle, um, I would be very, very patient with the opportunities that came my way. Do you think USC is a top three job in the country? No, not right now. Uh, I don't know that it ever was actually. Like it's it's there, it's in the running. But um, you mentioned like if Franklin were to go there, um, the Penn State opening, Penn State's like one where I could see Fickle being a pretty good fit um, and one you'd have to seriously consider. Although at that point you're going head to head with your alma mater and the school you coach most of your career at, and that becomes your entire life. Like, can we be better than Ohio State? Which is James Franklin's basically entire life at this moment, and probably Jim Harbaugh's. Yeah. Um, Greg and I had that conversation. I'm, I'm happy to, to find out, to have the realization that I am on your side in that. Uh, makes, me, make, makes, me feel, makes me feel good about myself. Um, do you think LSU is a top three job in the country? USC's over here. They're like, hey, man. Can you just give us one cycle? Like, don't open your, we just want this cycle where we're the best job. And LSU is like, nah, nope. Do you think LSU is the top three job? It's, it's really close. And you look at, so the last three head coaches who have been there have, have won national titles. Now, Nick Saban is one, um, but the other two are Les Miles and Ed Ogeron, who it looks like. It may not be long for, for that job unless something drastically changes. So it tells you that, one, the level you come in at as a, as a head coach at LSU is pretty high. Like, you've got everything you need in terms of, like, nearby talent, um, advantage over the rest of your conference opponents, most of them. Um, it's, it's a good spot. I, I'd have a tough time putting it ahead of Georgia at the moment and and maybe that's a little bit of recency bias but really georgia has kind of been building to this point for a while you know 10 or 15 years ago like we didn't talk about georgia as kind of a talent center 
for high school football players. And now we, we're talking about, you know, Atlanta might be more the most talent dense city in the country where previously that was probably Dallas or maybe, you know, you'd have to go back a ways. Uh, you could talk about California to, to bring it back to USC. But yeah, USC is probably a top 10 job. What, what keeps it there is you have, and you can still, I think, kind of own the West Coast. Um, but, I, I, you know, as, as kind of the talent becomes more concentrated in particularly the Southern cities, I'm not sure that advantage doesn't kind of wane a little bit each year. Yeah. Uh, and that's, again, that, I mean, that's a conversation that, that Greg Smith and I had, I think it was maybe last week or the week before where, where I was like, you know, if, even if you have a Pete Carroll type at USC, everyone is still coming to California and taking kids from California. Like, I don't think you're going to lock down the state's borders. Um, you are one of my favorite people to talk college football with, not exclusively for this reason, but because you will watch Toledo Eastern Michigan on a Tuesday night and be completely content with it. And just as excited as you would be for like Georgia, Kentucky on two at two 30 on Saturday on CBS. So last week, was that the most enjoyable weekend of college football in, in recent memory for you or one of the most enjoyable? Yeah, it was, it was up there. So I'm, I'm frequently a, at least two screens guy. Um, if it's, if it's really getting intense, we'll go three screens. And last week was a, was a three screen weekend. I mean, you, you obviously had the, the Red River game, one of the best in that series long history, but you also had to keep an eye on Ole Miss out or Ole Miss Arkansas because that game was totally nuts. Um, and that was fun. And then, you know, you had kind of, I think, maybe more than one, at least two games in each of those kind of classic time slots. You know, I was sitting here like doing all my paperwork, uh, which, you know, makes me sound really old, but <laughs> kind of, it's kind of, kind of true doing all my paperwork to get ready for, for Nebraska, Michigan and watching this Iowa Penn state game, you know, kind of go off the rails a little bit and trying to, keep an eye via the second screen on Alabama, Texas A&M as, as Nebraska and Michigan are going down to the wire. It was, it was a pretty great weekend. Um, and, 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 and in this case, it was like the biggest games of the weekend. You know, it wasn't, you had to go and look at um, Akron, Miami of Ohio for like, Hey, nobody was watching this game, but if you weren't, it was really great. Um, all the games people probably went into the week planning to tune into uh, ended up being pretty great finishes. It was the kind of weekend where at the end of the night, when UCLA Arizona was on, I was like, you know what? Normally I'm all about some PAC 12 after dark, but I was emotionally exhausted <laughs> from the day. I was like, I need to go to bed. Like <laughs> that's enough college football for the day. We, we went crazy. I'll, I'll catch up on NFL stuff tomorrow. Um, the, this weekend maybe doesn't have the fireworks and it certainly hasn't started off as great for you being someone that uh, is an ardent supporter of, of Appalachian state with what happened against uh, Billy Napier, who I would like to ask, and I'm sorry for doing so, but if Luke fickle stays at Cincinnati, is Billy Napier the, the next guy with the raging Cajuns on the list? Like I've been talking about this dude for a couple of years now, which isn't to be like, look at me because everybody's been talking about this dude for a couple of years. And if, if a schmuck like me looks at him and says, Hey, that's a pretty good coach. Like he's probably getting close to that next power five gig. What do you think of him? Uh, I think he probably is that guy who's second on the list um, might even be first on the list, which I think is the caveat with, with Napier. So I was very happy to have Tuesday night football um, back on. I was especially happy because it involved a team that I follow pretty closely that I have kind of a um, illogical can draw to in, in Appalachian state and the Mountaineers did not play well in that game. And the interesting thing to me about Napier is a lot of these G five coaches who become kind of next up quote unquote, do so via offense. And, and Napier as an assistant, his history is on offense, but I don't think Louisiana minus maybe one year of his tenure, they've always been right around 30 points a game. They're like scoring differential is 30 to 22, somewhere around there. I don't know if those are exact numbers, but if you average out his whole, whole tenure there, 
it's a style of football that I think is very portable to multiple conferences, which is, which is kind of, kind of strange. You know, a lot of these G5 guys, they get there because they have an offense that averages 45 points a game. You know, Lane Kiffin is, is probably kind of a classic example. Scott Frost, not entirely the, the fit there that I think Lane is, although look, he would have got hired at Nebraska, you know, regardless of if UCF was going 13 and 0 offensively or defensively because of the connection, but he probably gets interest from Florida and Tennessee and those other schools that were in the market then simply because the, the offense was that way. And I mean, Tennessee has Scott Frost's replacement right now and actually looks kind of good, um, better than expected at least doing it that way. Napier is more of what I would call kind of a straight up football guy, which is, which is good because I think he would be a good fit for almost any job in the country. The problem is, is like he, he's from Cookville, Tennessee. Almost all of his experience has been in the ACC or the SEC. He was at Clemson. He was Davo Sweeney's first offensive coordinator. Ended up getting fired for that job. Nick Saban said, hey, come to, come to my wayward home for fired coaches. And he did that. And, you know, that parlayed into this, this Louisiana job, which is a pretty good G5 job. I, I think I think he's slated for the ACC or for the SEC, maybe one of the best jobs in the ACC. I mean, we have it on good authority that he turned down the South Carolina job. And that's that's a place where you can you can go pretty high. It's not in the top half of jobs in the SEC, probably, but you can win there. Well, if you pay attention to the message boards, Nick Saban is on the hot seat now. So maybe he gets a shot at Alabama if things continue to just go sideways uh, for the tide. It's remarkable. Yeah. Um, it's been a very coach heavy podcast. So let's keep it that way, but let's transition to Nebraska, Minnesota. So the people listening to this have that kind of local tie. Um, let's start on the Minnesota side of things because PJ Fleck, it's a very divisive name around Nebraska. I like PJ a lot. I know most Nebraska fans can't stand him. There's certainly no love lost between the anti-sloganeering Scott Frost and the fast talker PJ Fleck. Um, the, the big question is Minnesota went 11-2 and two in 2019, had a great year, nice kind of breakthrough year for them. They beat Penn State at home. Big, awesome moment for the program. They're 6-6 six and six in their 12 games since, 3-2 and two this season. Was 2019 a fluke? No, I'm not ready to say that yet. I think what we've seen from Minnesota so far under Fleck is about what he is supposed to be at a job like that. And that's pretty good in my mind. So what they're going to be uh, is, is a team that's a tough out every week. I mean, you look at their year so far, they lost Mohamed Ibrahim devastating blow you know it's it's as big a loss as you could have for what they want to do in college football this year Trey Potts comes in pretty good he was after after their game two weeks ago they had a bye last week second in the Big Ten in rushing he gets a really frightening injury now he's gone and the thing the thing that stands out the most to me about PJ Fleck is like I look at this upcoming game with Nebraska and say, he'll find a way to keep him in it. And if you're a coach, you know, what else, what else is there? And I mean, I know like all this stuff changes with context. Like you can't be that kind of coach at LSU, um, but at Minnesota, you sure can. And they're going to do what they have to do. They're going to get quote unquote creative, which is what PJ Flex said this week to try and win some football games. And they'll mess with your eyes formationally and you know, they'll, they'll probably have a trick player too, particularly coming off of a bye week. And, and that's a ton of credit. It, for me, at least, find a way to give your team the best shot to win. It's not always going to be pretty. The win over Purdue wasn't pretty, but it was a win. So I, I, I trend more towards the ton of respect for, for PJ Fleck. Is 11 and two going to kind of be their new standard? No, their standard is... We're going to be we're going to be in games you think we shouldn't be in 
And when the stars kind of align, when you've got three future NFL wide receivers and Tanner Morgan kind of blacks out for a year and, and has his best year as a passer and all these things come together, then you can be looking at 11 and two and, and playing for the division championship on the last weekend of the season. And that's, so the, that's okay. The good thing is, is Fleck has done well to get like top talent wide receivers out on the field for them. You previewed a guy um, in, in your podcast. I'm sure we'll talk about him at wide receiver. He's had just a, a nice stable of really good running backs and has absolutely beefed up the offensive line. Um, the, they were like the, the, the quintessential 2020 team. They were just absolutely wrecked by COVID. And so you're just like, all right, well, I mean, I think we just throw this season out in terms of evaluation of Fleck as a coach. And then you get to this season and you were very high on them coming into the year. They look good against Ohio state. Mo Ibrahim looks like the best running back in the big 10. And then he gets hurt. And I'm glad that you, that you talked about sort of the, the impact of that injury on, on their team specifically, um, because that was where I was going next was like, it's not like, you know, like you look at a team, like let's say Penn state last weekend against Iowa, where they lose Sean Clifford and suddenly it's a completely different team. It's not a quarterback injury, but it has the same, it had the same kind of impact with this Minnesota team. Yeah, it absolutely did. I mean, even, you know, so they had pot, pots available for a good portion of that Purdue game and, and they're running the ball like 69% of the time. Like it's, it's really clear what they want to do. They want to, they want to run the game. And I mean, Fleck mentions this. I, I don't watch all of his interviews. That would be insane, but you know, I've seen a good, good amount of them. And like the degree to which I've heard him say time of possession and field position is, is probably more than I've heard it uttered from anybody at, at Nebraska. And I, yeah, that's, that's a difference in offensive philosophy to a degree, although field position doesn't have to be. Um, but that's, that's what they want to do. And if they've got a really great running back, which, which they had, and they can run the football, you know they're going to, P.J. Fleck, former wide receiver, is going to have pretty good talent at the wide receiver spot. They hit some of those big plays in the passing game. And, and that's what they do. In, in 2020, they were really hit hard by, by COVID. That was also a defense that lost a lot. Like going into the 2020 year when we thought it was going to be, you know, a normal 12-game season, you looked at that and said, oh, there's going to be some growing pains here with the defense. This year's defense, you know, it's not great. It's not kind of classic Big Ten, you can't move the ball at all. But it's really good against the run, and it's, it's pretty decent at, at, against the pass. They're just really sound. So I think my overall takeaway from PJ Fleck in the Minnesota era is that's what they're going to be. They're going to be really sound, which you've got to be in the Big Ten. On the other side of the ball, Boye Mafe for Minnesota continues um, weeks long trend of Nebraska getting some of the Big Ten's best pass rushers. So are you more interested in that matchup? with Mafe going against two young tackles for Nebraska who, uh, you know, looked, looked okay against, um, against Michigan, which I, you know, I should caveat, obviously Teddy Prohoshka is not going to be there anymore. Um, but Bryce Benhart came back in and wasn't, I guess, wasn't as bad as, as he was uh, to start the season. Um, so are you more interested in that matchup or are you more interested in Minnesota's once again, star receiver against Cam Taylor Britt? who had his best game of the season last year and newly minted black shirt, Quentin Newsom. Probably the offensive line and in how it handles um, Minnesota's pass rush and, and Mafe is, is the key guy there. And I think Nebraska can, and I think it might have to a little bit kind of scheme around that. You know, you were talking about the Michigan game. I, I think Nebraska's, offensive line, you know, regardless of who was in there and at, at tackle did better than I thought they would have done against that pair of defensive ends. Those guys are play at a really high level and Nebraska through kind of individual play and also how they chose to attack was able to negate that to a degree where they were in the game. They had a lead late. Um, Aiden Hutchinson didn't have a sack. Yeah. He didn't have a sack. Uh, That's yep. remarkable. So, you know, if it, <laughs> That, that shows me, I mean, it's, it's not a surprise. This Nebraska staff has always been really good at scheme. 
um, that they can they know what they need to do. And I think with this one, when you look at Minnesota's rush defense, and yeah, Ohio State's kind of easily the best offense they've faced, and it hasn't exactly been the toughest schedule um, from that perspective. Talking particularly about their offenses, like. Nebraska should have some advantages, but I do think I do kind of expect them to have to throw. And in particular, I think they're going to have to complete some tough passes that aren't just the deep shots to Samori Toure or Xavier Jets. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I'm so happy. Yes. And I think, I, think, I, I think Oliver Martin being back helps some with that. You know, we saw him have, I think he had two catches against Michigan early. And both of them were kind of tough, you know, contested catches. If Nebraska can make some ground that way, it's probably their their path of least resistance here. Though we saw last week in the first half, which was was pretty interesting, they really committed to the run, even though they weren't having a ton of success that way. Uh, Dylan Wright is currently sixth in the Big Ten in yards per catch. He's averaging about 19 yards a catch. If Minnesota's on its third back, and you're not really sure what to expect from him. What are the odds you think Minnesota comes out? Everybody expects them to run the ball. You've talked about it. They want to run the ball. They want to do that. They want to own time of possession. They're sixth nationally, I believe, in time of possession per game. Um, what are the odds that they come out and just say, you know what, we're just going to try to target Quentin Newsom and, and put Dylan right out there and just see what happens? I think low because I'm not sure. I'm not sure Tanner Morgan is built for that. I'd have to go back and look at, what his kind of career high in terms of pass attempts were. And it was probably in a game where they fell behind early and had to try and catch up that way. But they could do that because in addition to Dylan Wright, the Texas A&M transfer, you also have Chris Ottman Bell, who you would have, uh, I would have at least kind of mentioned as, oh, this is their best receiver. He He's good too. They've got another guy who I think is over, 18 yards per catch this year and I'm totally spacing on his name so they've got the talent out wide but you just look at Minnesota and how it's won and lost games with Tanner Morgan at quarterback and it's really stark I talked about this on on the I-80 preview he he drops below a 140 passer rating Minnesota loses most most of the time if he's above that Minnesota almost always wins and as your pass attempts creep up uh, above, and this is, I mean, this is even a low level. Like, I think they want to be at 20 pass attempts most of the time, 20 to 22. So them coming out and saying, well, all of our best players are now at wide receiver and we're just going to go that way. I'd be really, really surprised to see it. So this is why you're the best. You don't have these numbers in front of you, but uh, Tanner Morgan has only thrown 20 passes in a game once this season. It was the opener against Ohio State. He threw 25. The rest, 17, 17, 13 against Bowling Green, 18 against Purdue. Um, his career high is 37 pass attempts in a game against Wisconsin in 2019. They lost that game 38 to 17, so fell behind. And the wide receiver whose name you were trying to think of, Mike Brown-Stevens, has four catches for 139 yards this year. Yeah, they're just, you know, and it's it's – Again, this is one that I can kind of turn into credit to PJ Fleck as well, because you look at, okay, they've got that complimentary receivers. Now you look at the guys who were there in the previous years, who've gone on to the NFL and you're like, you know, you could be a really, really balanced offense, but it goes back to sort of these foundational things that Fleck always talks about. Of <laughs> We want to possess the ball. We want to win, win field position that's their best path to victory. And you got to keep those NFL caliber wide receivers happy by saying, I mean, Dylan Wright has nine catches through five games. You know, it's, we're not going to get you the ball a ton, but they're going to be, they're going to be big plays when we do. Nebraska has dabbled in the, the time of possession. We're going to dominate the ball. They did it against Oklahoma to, to some degrees of success. They kept the offense off the field. Um, but this is starting to look like for Nebraska, the offense that, um, at least in terms of creativity, probably not schematically, but at least in terms of creativity, the, the offense that people expected to see from Scott Frost. What was your overarching takeaway um, after the, the Michigan game? Because Frost has been on the hot seat. He was fired after the Illinois game by a lot of people. 
and now they've they've they, they've they've stacked close losses that maybe they shouldn't have lost in certain people's eyes, but they've stacked good performances and competitive performances against highly ranked teams. So like, where are you at with Frost? Do you think he has saved his job moving forward, at least throughout the, the this year? I, I think so. Um, and I was, you know, a person, and I think a lot of people probably were there who came into this saying like, oh yeah, this year, like, isn't a danger year for for this coaching staff and then you have how they lost to illinois not just that they lost to illinois that really called a bunch of that into question and and that game really exists for for me at least as an outlier like nebraska hasn't looked like that in all of the games that have come since the biggest point for me though, in, in an interview with ESPN this week, Trev Alberts said like everything that was in the three and a half years prior to when I got here is, is in the past. And, and Trev Alberts is somebody who's earned the benefit of the doubt with me to the degree where when he says that, I don't think he's just saying that. I think he's like, my evaluation of this coaching staff started the day I took the job. And when you look at it from that context, okay, you've got the week zero loss, which was dumb and bizarre in all of the ways we've already dissected. But it's, it's tough to find fault beyond the, well, you haven't won those games. Like you've been close, in Oklahoma, Michigan State, Michigan. Good job, but you didn't win. I don't know if Trev Alberts is in a point with having this athletic director transition when we had it where he's looking at that much of a bottom line yet. Like every coaching staff eventually gets there. So I guess the question is, um, what I'm trying to say is, was Trev Alberts arriving a, maybe not a hard reset, but at least a soft reset for how this football program is going to be measured? If that's the case, and that's what I think, um, I think Nebraska is in a pretty good spot in terms of this coaching staff getting the opportunity to carry things on. I mean, he has intentionally avoided putting a specific number on things, which is, which has really helped frost. The last guy, the guy whose job he took said bowl game, you got to get to a bowl game. That's the expectation. That's the baseline. And so a lot of us coming into the season thought, well, they have to go six and six. Otherwise, you know, we start having this conversation when we get to December Alberts came in and said, I'm never going to put a win total expectation on things. And just to kind of see him on the field, hugging Frost after the Michigan game to hear that he's at practices, he's with coaches talking to them about how proud he is of, of everything that's going on. Um, it, you know, you can certainly see a situation where despite losses continuing to, to creep up in, in moments where you think, okay, they're finally over this they are on the right track and the boss believes that they are on the right track. Um, my column last weekend was kind of to that end. I, I have waffled on Scott Frost all season long after the Oklahoma game. Um, I was, I, I think I was one of the few on our staff that was like, you know what? I'm done with moral victories. They did it again. They got to find a way to win these games. I don't know the answer for how they flipped that switch, but it's got to get flipped. And I don't know, like, if it continues to happen, I don't know if that says something about the head coach or if that's something else. I don't know. But this is, like, we had, we've had too many of these situations. And then it happens again against Michigan State, and then it happens again against Michigan. But against Michigan, and I talked to Greg about this, against Michigan, it didn't feel like Oklahoma. I've said this several times. They, It didn't feel like they were, like, just hanging around because the other team was making mistakes. It felt like they were genuinely in the game because they were competitive and they belonged on the field with Michigan. And that says something good about Frost. And so I'm kind of at the point where I feel like, what does changing the coach help? What, is it, what does it change? Because a lot of the things that a coach is tasked with are things that Frost is doing well. His team fights for him. They play together. They play hard. They're doing schematically what he wants them to do. They look creative. They kind of look like the offense that you expect. They've shown a lot of growth defensively. They've developed guys defensively. Like what is a, is a job responsibility of a head coach that Frost is not doing? And, and I know that there's the, the loss element of it, but can you think of one? 
No, not not at the moment. I mean, retention maybe. Maybe that's the only one with all the transfer portal mess they've had. That would be one. And you know, if if things get turned around and there's like no question, and Nebraska, which I think Nebraska has built on everything that came before to this point, if it continues to do that, it would have to come with more wins. But if we're three years down the road and the retention piece of it is what it has been over the previous three years that that becomes a little bit of concern and i you know i'm somebody who thinks nebraska by the nature of how it has to recruit and how broad of a area it has to recruit from is always going to be a high um attrition school i think it's just kind of baked in for for what they have to do to get the kind of talent they need for a program of nebraska's historical standing though a good sign would be if that started to come down and the other part of it is is like everything in the transfer market totally changed in the time that this this coaching staff took over so it kind of scrambles everything in that regard but you know a lot of what frost said um in in the preseason and he continues to say it now he said that this week uh, in terms of going to minnesota he's like this is our most grown-up team the key is they look that way like talking about, you know, in July or whatever about, yeah, this is a really tight knit group. It looks that way now. So it's still not like there's a version of this season where Nebraska beats Illinois, probably still loses to Oklahoma and say it splits Michigan State or Michigan. And you've got kind of the classic like, oh, things are happening now. Like it's it's taking off and you're not going to you're not going to go. I mean, the UCF year in 2017 was so kind of outside the norm in that every one of those games kind of went their way. Uh, that sort of ramp up is really, really rare. This sort of ramp up that Nebraska is trying to do is also rare. So when we talk about Frost and his you know, job status and all of those decisions that could come in the future, it's kind of like, is there hidden value? in being more patient than you normally would because in college football we've seen like it's kind of like a three maybe four years like that's what you get to turn something around and if you don't then we're off and we'll you know try to get the best person we can or whoever is the hot g5 name at the moment that being the case is there value in saying nope we're going to wait this out we're going to see what playing this slower does because not many programs do it at this point. Yeah, I feel like I, I'm constantly flip-flopping on this because I have argued for a long time that continuity in sports is is so, so valuable. Um, but I also, you know, we start talking about Scott Frost and I hear Bill Conley on the Solid Verbal podcast in my head saying, if a coach doesn't have it figured out by year three, then statistically based on his model, they're not going to get it figured out. And and I hear that, but then I'm like, Frost? I mean, I don't, I mean, maybe he's figured it out, you know, maybe, you know, took it, it took an extra year. And of course he's got the weird like COVID year in, in his rebuild situation. And, and that certainly doesn't help, especially with a young team. And they had a new offensive coordinator, which doesn't get talked about enough, by the way, like Matt Lubick, it feels like Matt Lubick's been here forever. He's in his second year, really like one and a half years. Or if you want to go with the, the popular vernacular in college football, which I hate last year was a, a year zero for Matt Lubick. And this is his first year. Um, my, my big conclusion at the end of the mission game, and this was what I wrote in my column was that frost is the guy. It seems like frost is the guy. And now it's just about, we just got to wait for some of these heartbreaking losses to just go away. And at this point, the only question is how long is that going to take? But it seems like frost is the guy. Do you agree with that, that general takeaway? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, with those, with how Nebraska has lost a bunch of its games, you know, I, I look at that and be like, okay, you're right there. Like the string of losses they've had this year to lose all four of your, of the four games that you've lost kind of in that fashion is extremely unlikely. Like, you know, eventually one of those flips and it just goes the other way. So it's kind of like, if, if that's our primary complaint, our primary hesitation with, with this coaching staff, is it really that much? It, it would be such a bizarre string of events if you had a coach who's like, yeah, if you look at the power rankings, whichever ones you prefer, 
he consistently had a team in the top 30, say, which, I mean, Nebraska wasn't there early in his tenure, but it has been lately, uh, consistently produced a top 30 team, and they just found bizarre ways to lose games. It would be such an outlier that you're kind of like, well, I guess, you know, we just got unlucky in that one. We just had somebody who, like, when it came down to it, couldn't win a coin flip. And, and that doesn't, not many of those guys that I can think of off the top of my head actually exist. Yeah, this is the most interesting situation in college football because Scott Frost does not cause Adrian Martinez to fumble the ball like, like, like milliseconds before the whistle is blown. But you say, well, well, Scott Frost needs to teach him better ball security and they need to work on ball security in practice and he needs to not turn the ball over so much. Well, they have. Adrian's no, turnover numbers are down. They're just happening at the worst time. So, you know, this is, this is, this is the most interesting situation in, in college football coaching. Um, and so I have a, a hypothetical for you, Brandon. Nebraska is trailing 20 to 17 in the fourth quarter against Minnesota because they gave up a late touchdown with five minutes to go and they have the ball with a chance to, to tie or win and they fail to get it done and they lose to Minnesota. Does, does any of this change for you? No, probably not. But the conversation around it will change drastically. I mean, this is a this is a high t- high stakes spot, I think, for for Nebraska. And I've used that term so much this season, which makes me question it. But it also feels like it's kind of an apt representation. I mean, you think about the difference of going to Minnesota as a slight favorite your eighth game in a row to start the season. You got to get to the bye week. I think it's pretty clear that Nebraska is a better team than Minnesota right now, but Minnesota is a team that kind of strikes in just the right area of like, yep, we know what we're going to do. We don't care if it doesn't look fancy. Like we're just going to do what we got to do to, to get it done. Nebraska is the team that does the more exciting things better and keeps being undone by the less notice, noticeable stuff that that helps you win football games. So, oh, you know, they beat Minnesota. Say that happens. You go in, you're like, okay, well, they've got a chance in every game left. They'll be a pretty solid favorite against Purdue. Ohio State and Iowa are at home. You'll take that. They lose it. And I think then a lot of this talk comes back up, but – just kind of my general worldview and my view on football is that no one game should ever change your thinking that much, but it, it certainly will on talk radio and podcasts and, and everywhere else. Should that come to pass? Are you saying that I'm a hot take machine on this podcast? Is that what, is that what you were just alluding to? No, I'm, I'm not saying that because I don't right. believe that. But if you do write that after the Minnesota game, well, I mean, we kind of laid it out here. So I'm just going to lean into it now. You know that it's a high stakes spot for you too. So this podcast is just going to turn into uh, Coach X should get fired now. <laughs> now do it one week into the season. You didn't want to do it in the no. Do it one week into the season. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> um. Yeah. This game's weird. Seems like a lot of people don't really know what to make of Minnesota, and you know, a, as a result, it's a, a game that not a ton of people know what to make of. And there's a scenario in, in my head where Nebraska is, you know, like they're, they're like four or five plays away from being six and one this season, mm-hmm. something like that, five and two, six and one. And, uh, you know, obviously because those plays didn't go their way, they are three and four and, you know, they could get to four and four this weekend, or they could drop to three and five and you have to beat one of uh, Ohio state or Iowa or Wisconsin or you know you have to beat one of Ohio State or Iowa to make a bowl game if you drop this one yeah it's it's a it's a it's a tough spot for Nebraska but I think it's a good spot because you're on the road they come in healthier than I thought they would have being this that this is the eighth straight game that they played so that's good certainly but it's a game where you got to do all of the like football dirty work to actually get it done, which has been kind of the persistent question with Nebraska is can they do the mundane stuff and, and get a win? If they do, they'll write into 
the remaining four games of the season on, on a pretty high note. And three of those four games are at home. So it's, it, it'll be for a, for a 11 a.m. game at Minnesota or with a gopher team, like you said, that I don't know that a lot of people are sure what to do with. And I'm, I'm certainly not either. It's not, it doesn't have the curb appeal of Michigan, Nebraska, or even just playing Northwestern under the lights. I think the most probable scenario here is there's a, there's a bigger share of the pie where this game looks like Nebraska Northwestern than it does one of the losses this season, but you can't like the slice of the pie where Minnesota makes things really difficult and even wins isn't insignificant. No. One thing that, that you have to appreciate about Nebraska, and when I say you, I mean us in the media, is that they, they just constantly give us drama and great storylines. It's great. They give us stuff to write about. And when there is drama, Scott Frost doesn't act like a child and shut down media for the rest of the week. So shouts to him for that. Brandon, you probably have to go. I had to get one last shot in as you're chuckling. You know I had to do that. You have to go. Thank you for coming on this podcast. I appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll be back next week with another one. In the meantime, keep reading HailVarsity.com. Make sure you read the website this weekend because Hail Varsity, Brandon, the crew that will be in Minnesota, they will have all the coverage that you need. I'll have a column Sunday. We'll be back next week. Thanks, guys. Hood at Media Production.